Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Oh, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. and stain he washed it white as snow or nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb for Jesus paid it all and stain he washed it white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat that Jesus paid it all Stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, it's his amazing love I'm thankful for today. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken, and I'm accepted. You were. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well.
Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Father, we just thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross, Lord, so that we could be saved. God, we uh, know that without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us that there is no remission of sin, Lord. And God, we need it now more than ever. Lord, we uh, need your cleansing touch. And we just uh, thank you for those of us. Lord, they're able to be here today to help lead worship, to help lead people to be able to hear the gospel and the message and the good news, Lord, through those that watch this. And I do pray for those that are at home, Lord, that wherever they may be, that, Lord, whether they're watching this live or later, that, Lord, they'll hear the simple message that <clears throat> there is a God that loves them, that he sent his one and only son to go to a cross and shed his blood because we were sinners, God, and the only way we could be saved is and forgiven. Lord, it's because of the blood of Jesus to wash us white as snow, as that song we just said. And I just do pray that whatever we are able to say today, that it will touch someone's heart. Lord, I pray for someone that may be watching that uh, during this time, Lord, is scared and worried and just doesn't know where to turn. Lord, they haven't surrendered their life to you. I pray that, Lord, through something that's said, they'll realize their need for accepting you as their Savior. Lord, I pray for, uh, for our church family as a whole, that you'll just bless and surround us, Lord, and Fill each one with love and peace that only you can give, Lord. We pray for comfort during this time. Lord, pray for our leaders. Pray for everyone, Lord, uh, that we'll just all turn to you and seek you now more than ever, Lord, because we do need you, Lord. So just help us and bless us in this time. Bless Brother Darrell as he shares your word in a few minutes. And uh, speak to us through what it says in Jesus' name. Amen. My own, my own brother Rick? Good deal. I know I'm not on, nobody in here can hear me except a few of y'all, but y'all at home, glad you can hear me. If you hear us later on, thank you for tuning in to Mount Vernon Baptist Church today. Uh, this is our new normal, uh, May, Facebook Live, uh, on everything streaming, everything is uh, uh, on uh, reality or on, on the screens these days, but um, certainly our God is nearer than ever before. He's right near us and uh, we can reach out and and. and and reach him. He is. Uh, he's wanting to have that personal relationship with us, and um, certainly thankful you've joined us this day. 
Um, we are Facebook Live today. We also have an Instagram account now with Mount Vernon, MVBC, Baxley, Georgia. If you want to join us that way, uh, Brother Darrell's been doing some podcasts or some kind of uh, pastor's porch, I believe you ca we'd call it, and uh, certainly want to tune in as we, uh, as we do those. And uh, like I said, this is our new normal. Cole and I are, are trying this Zoom thing out. So older youth, younger youth, uh, the Zoom app is what we've been using. Uh, I think Cole has done a Facebook Live. I may try one of those. Um, they may run me off of there. I don't know. But um, anyway, listen out for our next Zoom meeting, kids. Uh, Tiffany and Heather have been doing uh, Facebook Live, or sorry, Instagram Live, as well as some Zoom meeting with the ladies. So thankful for them for doing that. Um, also, if you'd like to give, uh, the, the app that we've been using is Tithely. Um, that is an um, app you can download. You can search for um, MV or Mount Vernon Baptist Church, not MVBC, but Mount Vernon Baptist. If you start typing M and T in there in the search bar, you will see our church. You can add it, and uh, you can then send through your bank account uh, by adding your routing number and check number. Or um, you can uh, do it through a debit card or other card. If you'd like to mail it in, 459 GW Turner Road, uh, you can send that to Lamar Turner at 459 GW Turner Road, Baxley, Georgia, 315133. But we're thankful you're uh, tuning in. Uh, happy Palm Sunday. We're within a week of Easter, and it um, uh, doesn't seem that far off, but I think back 2,000 years ago, and the things that happened in that week from Palm Sunday until our Lord laid down his life for our sins, and then rose again victoriously over death, hell, and the grave. So we're thankful today, and I'm going to turn it over to Brother Cole as he brings the uh, prayer request. With Jesus' blood, he came and shed it on the cross for, uh, for our sins, to, to pay for that sin debt. Brother Jonathan, as we're singing those songs, I'm also reminded of the fact uh, that your greatest sin and my greatest sin, the debt for that was paid for. And, and Jesus tells us that we are the light of the world. And he'd never tell us to be the light of the world if he did not provide a way for us to come out of the darkness of guilt and shame. And I'm thankful for that this morning as we're coming into this Easter week. Uh, before Brother Darrell preaches, we want to share some uh, prayer concerns with you. Uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m., we need to be in prayer for the Navadeen Sellers family. Uh, it was shared with me this morning that there will be a graveside service tomorrow at the Zion Baptist Church at 3 p.m. But please understand that it is for family only due to the COVID-19 uh, situation. And so we want to be in prayer for that family as they're going through that time in their lives. Uh, we also have uh, members that are in the hospital and in nursing facilities that we want to uh, remind you to keep in prayer. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Jimmy Woods, who was uh, flown to Savannah uh, over the last few couple of days here, and also got word this morning that uh, Mr. Jerry Gerald is also at the hospital in Savannah with a uh, episode that's going on with his heart. Uh, in the nursing facilities, we need to lift up in prayer Miss Betty Dykes, who's over in Jessup, uh, Kenny Gilbert and Vidalia. Uh, we also need to keep in uh, prayer Mr. J.E., or Brother J.E. and Miss Jean Blanton. Uh, as Miss Jean is over at a nursing facility in Douglas and uh, Brother J.E. and his uh, health as well. Uh, we want to keep all those folks in prayer. We also uh, want to be reminded uh, as we're seeking the Lord and, and lifting people up uh, to pray for Miss Marsha Turner, who is at home. Uh, we want to continue to pray for her, but uh, also pray for uh, Danny Turner and Miss Melba Thornton and her son Charles. And as Brother Darrell gets ready to come preach the word, please join us in prayer. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We ask now that you would clear our minds, open our ears, and soften our hearts. As Brother Darrell comes to preach your word, I pray that you would speak to us and move in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jonathan and Kim and uh, Ricky and Ann uh, for all the work that y'all are doing to try to help us be able to continue to serve our Lord and uh, minister in the name of Christ. Uh, uh, certainly, we do want to keep these folks in prayer that uh, Cole has just mentioned. We have some very serious needs among our church family, uh, not only uh, because of the uh, virus problem that we're going through, but because of these particular situations and 
and we ask you to pray for them. Hold them up close to you and, and pray God will bless them. Now, we do want to ask you, if you join us this morning, I'd ask you to turn to John chapter 3. If you uh, happen to catch us last week on Sunday morning, we were in John chapter 3. We read the first seven verses of Scripture and uh, dealt with the realization that Jesus said, ye must be born again. It's not debatable. It's not optional. Uh, he said, ye must. And I personally appreciate that. I like it that God is absolute. Uh, he is definite. He is uh, uh, sold on this. It's not debatable. And, and to me, that's a big plus because I like to be able to uh, know with a confidence and an assurance of what we're doing and, and uh, what we're dealing with. So uh, I appreciated his dealing with that last week when he dealt with Nicodemus and said, ye must be born again. Now, we got through verse 7. I want to pick up with verse 8 and read a few verses of Scripture uh, following here in John chapter 3. Uh, Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto ye, uh, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, uh, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, let's bow for prayer again, please. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the absolute trustworthiness of it. And I pray, God, you would use it, not necessarily Daryl Quinn, Lord, but your word for your glory, your honor, your praise. And, and God, if we do anything that brings glory to you, we've already learned, Lord, it winds up being good for us too. Now, God, I pray you take this time, use it for your glory, and we'll praise you and thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, let's go back there and start where we read first there in verse 8. At verse 8, talking about the wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, I think we all can uh, testify to it sometime in our life, if not regularly in our life, uh, listening to the wind blow through the pine trees here in South Georgia, the whispering sound that it makes, or going through the trees and uh, the leaves as they rustle. Uh, it's, it's a pleasant sound most of the time, uh, but the thing is, we don't see the wind. You just see the results of the wind. I personally think when I read this verse of Scripture, it's, it's like I, I've noticed that there are times when some folks who have had a bad reputation, they've been a little on the rowdy side, and they get saved and they change. And it, it's something different about it. And you may not be able to look at them and put your finger on uh, the reason for the change, but it's the work of God's Holy Spirit in a person's life. God can take the sorriest, dirtiest, meanest sinner and make a saint out of them. And that, that's a change that you might not see the work but you see the results, and we say praise the Lord. Well, Nicodemus was saying, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him and said, you're a master of Israel, you don't know this? Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I personally believe that we could read this verse 11 a little easier if we simply took the pronouns, and instead of uh, reading we speak and we do and, and we have seen, uh, I, I think maybe just right, uh, Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this. I've seen this. And, and so Christ is speaking directly to Nicodemus. He's trying to make this plain to him there and uh, saying in verse 11. But in verse 12, he said, For if I have told you earthly things uh, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And, and then he, he puts in a puzzle here. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. Now, when I first read this, verse, is verse 13, and I try to put all this together, I'm thinking to myself, now wait a minute, I remember a story in the Bible of a man that did go to heaven. But now here's the catch. 
The story of the Apostle Paul when he was stoned at Lystra over in the book of Acts, and then if you go on to uh, the, the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 12 and you read the story of what Paul had to say about the day he died at Lystra, uh, at least that's what I believe, and, and others that I respect uh, have the same opinion, that they stoned the Apostle Paul, killed him, left him in the dirt there, and his spirit ascended up to glory. And there in uh, his writings to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he began to try to describe what happened. He said, I don't know really. And he winds up saying that he saw and heard unspeakable things. They were so glorious, so wonderful that he didn't even have words to say. Well, I think that that's a relative to what Jesus is saying here. And he's talking about how that... Uh, no one at the day that Christ said these words in John chapter 3, the, the book of Acts was not in progress yet. And so here in John 3, when Christ is speaking to Nicodemus, he could say, nobody's ever been there and seen it, but later on, Paul did go. He saw the glories, and he, he came back to earth, and he, and he was excited about it, but he couldn't talk about it. He didn't know how to describe it, didn't know what, what he could say about it, except that it was the third heaven, the third heaven. Amen. Well, anyway, we have uh, Jesus and Nicodemus are having this conversation, and uh, he's trying to get it through to him. But then he comes to verse 14, and verse 14 is, is powerful in my opinion. And it says this, For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Well... You start talking about the old devil and uh, his actions, you, you kind of get bogged down in some junk. Moses lifted up the serpent. Well, the serpent is mentioned a number of times in the Word of God. Uh, uh, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, as a matter of fact, and that's when uh, he tempted Eve and he uh, tricked her. Uh, let me just give you three examples that I know of uh, that we can talk about. First of all, in Genesis chapter 3, Eve and the devil, the serpent, had a conversation. And back then, Satan was doing exactly the same thing that he's doing today in the USA. He, he came to Eve and said, Hath God really said, in Genesis chapter 3, did God really say that? He's causing doubt to be put on it. And I'll guarantee you every single one of us have at some time or another had somebody who had more education than they had sense and they'd want to doubt the teachings of the Word of God because they can't understand it. It's beyond them. It's above them. Well, Satan made it plain. Do you really think that God said you're going to die if you eat of this fruit? <sighs> doubt. Well, now, the devil went on from just trying to cause doubt, and he went into absolute lying. He said, you shall not surely die. So now you see, that's exactly what the devil is doing today. There are people who are causing others to doubt the precious Word of God. Our boys and girls are going, uh, raising up in, in schools and situations where leaders of our land and leaders of the whole world are trying to deny and cause doubt on the teachings of the precious Word of God. But now, wait a minute. The devil's been doing that from the beginning. What we've got to realize, it's nothing new. We fight it the same way that it has been fought ever since as Jesus himself and uh, Matthew chapter 4, when he personally confronted Satan in the wilderness, whenever the devil would throw accusations at him and thoughts at him, Jesus would simply do what? Quote Scripture. We fight the devil with the Word of God. Stay true to the Word of God. Don't go off on some tangent and try to say, well, my opinion is, my idea is. No, no, no. When it comes to that type of thing, we don't need Daryl Quinn's opinion. Don't need your opinion. We need to know what is thus saith the Lord. Well, now, Jesus lets it be known that we can trust what he said. The serpent there in uh, uh, Genesis was tempting Eve, trying to get her to not believe the teachings that were there from God. Now, the second thing I would give to you, it's actually connected to what uh, is being said here by Jesus in, in John 3, 14. Uh, it's when he's talking about um, uh, lifting up the serpent. Back in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, in chapter uh, 21, let me read a few verses of Scripture for you. It deals with this subject. It's Numbers chapter 21, beginning with verse 4. And these Scriptures say this. And they journeyed, talking about the nation of Israel, out in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Edom. And the soul of the people 
was much discouraged because of the way. Now, I can understand that. I trust you can too. These Israelites were traveling through that wilderness, and uh, it hadn't been a good, easy journey. They'd had their problems. They had to cross the Red Sea. Uh, fortunately, God did that miraculous work of drying up the Red Sea and letting them cross, and then he brought it back together and drowned the Egyptians there. But these people, the Israelites who were traveling through uh, the wilderness, here in this verse 4 of uh, Numbers chapter 21, it says it very plain. It says, uh, the people was much discouraged because of the way. Life can be rough. The, the journey of life and all that we go through can have some tough days and tough times. And uh, we see it, it happened for them. They were discouraged. They were down and out. They were tired. Now, God blessed them in a bunch of ways, wonderful ways. Their shoes never wore out. Forty years and one pair of shoes. Glory. Uh, the, they always had something to eat, but they didn't like what they had to eat. Listen, look what it says here. Uh, this verse 4 winds up saying, uh, the people was much discouraged because of the way. And verse 5 says, and the people spake against God and against Moses and wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness for there is no bread neither is there any water now hold on the, the, as often happens when people get started running their mouths and fussing griping and complaining we wound up saying things that are not true it happens every day uh, in all of our lives. We wound up stretching the truth or just plain lying. These fellows were just plain lying. That verse says, and they were fussing because the way was tough and they didn't like what they were having to go through. And it said, for there is no bread. That's a lie. They had bread. The matter of fact, that verse of Scripture goes on. The very last two lines of verse 5 in, in uh, Numbers 21 says, and our soul loatheth this light bread, the manna. They had bread. They, it was light bread. I, I like light bread. Don't y'all like light bread? I, I'd like to make sandwiches out of light bread. I, I don't know what this bread. I've, I've often said that I personally think since it was small, round, white, uh, and uh, kind of sweet to the taste apparently, I think maybe it was donuts. But no, you know, that's just a joke or whatever. But these people had already had enough of that light bread, whatever it was, and they were tired of it. They didn't want it anymore. They wanted to be uh, able to have their own preference and all. Well, they were fussing and crapping and complaining. The way was tough. It was hard. Uh, the, the going was not easy. And they had a food to eat that they didn't really want to eat. They wanted something else. They wanted to be picky. Uh, I've heard some folks say uh, this uh, last couple of days that whenever this... Uh, uh, shelter in place situation gets over and the restaurants are able to open back up. Ain't going to be a bunch of folks going to the restaurants. I fully believe that. I am going to be one of them. I'm looking forward to that seafood dinner. But anyway, here we're seeing these folks uh, in the wilderness fussing and griping and complaining because they didn't have to eat what they wanted to eat and the traveling was rough. And they were fussing. Now, to fuss at Moses is one thing. He's just another man. But when they're going to fuss at God, they just lost it. They went crazy. Verse 6 says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel, uh oh, there's one of those four letter words, died. Yes, they did. They died. They murmured, griped, and complained, and fussed. And God said, okay. And he sent them serpents among them to bite them, and many of them died. Oh, man. Well, verse 7 says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Wait a minute. Well, at least they acknowledged it, and at least they could realize what they had done wrong. They were murmuring and griping and complaining. Lord, have mercy. They must have been from the USA. Uh, and just fussing and griping because they didn't have their way, and life was not easy enough for them. Uh, they were having a rough time of it. Well, when you start fussing against God, friend, you're doing the wrong thing. God sent the serpents among them because they had run their mouths and used their tongues to do that which is not wise. You don't fuss at God and complain about God's man. But that's what they did. And, Lord, did they have to pay the price for it. And verse 7 says it, uh, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Well, now, 
that shows he had a, a, maybe a, a bigger heart than most of us. These very folks who had just been fussing, griping, and complaining at him and about him, he turned around and prayed for them. Well, he did. And, he, and look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, uh, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now, that's interesting to me. And that is a, is a huge truth buried in that verse of Scripture. Jesus is telling him to make a fiery serpent out of brass. It's going to shine. And stick it up on a pole high up in the air. And then any man or woman out there who is bit by one of these serpents, if they'll just look to that serpent, and when they look at that serpent, they can be healed of the bite of the serpent. Now, that's the instructions from God. Moses built that serpent. And uh, he, he put it on that pole, and the people began to realize, okay, and they found out if they looked to that serpent on the pole, they were healed. God spared them from dying. Now, I don't know about you, but Lord, there's some similarities. You ever read over in the book of James? Um, uh, I tell you what, let's turn there, James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and uh, some scriptures that are, that are found here beginning with verse 2, James chapter 3 and verse 2 and, and following. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is, and the King James Version here says, the same is a perfect man uh, and able to bridle the whole body. Now the point of this verse is any person who can control their tongue all the time, they are a good one. They are doing an exceptionally good job. Uh, perfect is not probably the best word to use there. Uh, they're not perfect. We're all sinners. But yet they have reached a place of maturity and completeness where they have learned how to control what they say, their tongue. Boy, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Probably all of us. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever met anybody who always was able to control his thumb. I've even heard some of the greatest preachers in America who wound up after saying something, I won't call their name, but they turned around at a convention, thousands of preachers and laymen there in the room, thousands, I'm talking 25,000. And he said something, and then in about a minute he stopped and turned around and looked at a whole congregation and said, I didn't need to say that. I apologize. I, because none of us can truly control our tongue all the time. And here God's letting that be known through James. He's making that truth known. We have a problem. It's our tongue. And verse 3 says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, and they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. A, a bit's a little bitty thing. The mouth of the horse is one of the smaller parts of the body of the horse. And yet through that bit that's in the mouth of that horse, you can make that whole horse do what you want it to do. And verse 4 says, And behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, uh, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, uh, whithersoever the governor listed. So uh, a ship out there knows you can be guided by just a, a small rudder, just a little bit of work on that rudder, and it can make that ship go the way it the driver wants it to go. Verse 5 says, And even so the tongue is a little member, but it boasteth great things. And behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, and so is the tongue among our members. Hold on. He's making it plain. Us and our tongue, it's a problem. We insult people. You know, the best thing we can do is just keep our mouth shut. I believe there's a verse in Proverbs that says something like, even a fool, if he keeps his mouth shut, people think he's smart. And so and I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. When you sit around and you don't say much, you don't uh, get involved in the conversation, show what you do think, uh, people are able to think you're a pretty smart fella, pretty smart. Well, now, hold on. God is trying to teach us something here. I want you to realize this. From uh, the Garden of Eden, when the serpent came and tempted Eve, to the wilderness when Moses was being fussed at and griped about and complained about and all the people were uh, murmuring against God and against Moses to the book of James and the teachings that are there, we're seeing that our tongue has some distinct similarities to a fiery serpent. It is, according to God's word, our tongue is set on fire from 
hell, the hellish thoughts, the meanness, the evilness that is down inside of all of us somewhere, it comes up and comes out almost always from our tongue. We say things we should not say. We, we talk about folks in such a way as uh, it's embarrassing. And I know we're all guilty. I know I've, I've been guilty of it. There have been times when I've gone home and my wife said, do you know what you said? I said, when? And she would go back to some time when we were talking to somebody that day and, and uh, maybe even while I was preaching. And she said, well, you said. And I said, no, I didn't say that. And I said, yes, you did. And I realized, man, I have messed up. That's not right. Nobody is exempt from this. I'm sorry. We all have a problem with this fiery serpent that is in our mouth, a tongue. It's a problem, and uh, we've got to understand that. Well, I, I want you to understand this verse of Scripture here is verse 14 in John chapter 3. It's pointing out that as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness that resembled uh, through the teachings from Genesis to James a fiery serpent, a tongue that is a problem. But now look here. He said the last half of this verse 14, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now just to pick up for a moment, if you can remember, if you heard me last Sunday morning, I tried to be emphatic. I did. I tried to be dogmatic. I tried to be absolute. We must be born again. You have no other choice. You either get born again or you do not go to the glories of heaven. But now hold on. Here, same sermon, same discussion, if you will. Uh, Jesus and Nicodemus having the same discussion, and he gets to this point, and he's, now he's not talking about ye must be born again, but he's talking about that uh, uh, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Oh, boy. Easter's next Sunday. Lord, how much time. We got a lot of uh, Jonathan and, and uh, those of us here at the church uh, talking about what can we do and how should we do and what's proper with all the, the problems that we're seeing here around us with this uh, virus, et cetera. And what can we do? It's Easter Sunday. I've had the joy of being pastor here at Mount Vernon for 36 years. In 36 years, I think there's been two Sunday Easter mornings that we wound up coming inside and not having an outside uh, sunrise service. One was because it was raining, and the other was because it was 28 degrees. And I did, must confess to you, I had some men fuss at me for saying, coming inside on that morning. It was 28 degrees. And I looked at them, I said, we have a lot of senior women who love to come to our sunrise service. I'm not going to ask senior women to go out there and sit on a little metal folding chair uh, and at 28 degrees. And we came inside. Now, that's two times. Now, other than that, I think we, we've been outside for a sunrise service every Easter. What a joy. What a blessing to watch the sun come up and think about how uh, Mary and Martha and uh, Salome and the rest of those women all that went to the graveyard back there on that first Easter morning and how that, that Jesus rose up from that. Now, hallelujah, that's a good one. But today is the Sunday when Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem. And I'm sure all around us you can get a pile of great sermons out there from men who are preaching on the Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry. And uh, I've noticed on Facebook many folks have palm leaves on the front doors. And that's amen, amen. Celebrate it, celebrate it. But here we, we need to realize Jesus had to go there. Some of the disciples fussed whenever he said he was going back to Jerusalem. No, no, Master, they, they want to kill you there. Let's don't go there. He said, I must. And here in this verse of Scripture, this verse 14, it said, And so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You do understand. If Jesus had not gone to Calvary's cross, you and I would have no choice. We'd have no way to get to heaven because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. Sorry, none perfect, no, not one. Maybe my sin is different than your sin, but we're all sinners. And sin has opened up the way for us to make it to a lake of fire. Jesus has opened up the way for us to make it to heaven. Go back and read Psalms 22. Lord, have mercy. You can't enjoy the victory of Psalms 23 
favorite chapter of the whole Bible, I'm sure, by the majority of the world. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we go through there. And, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We love to claim that and hallelujah for that. But you ain't going to get to Psalm 23 unless you pass through Psalm 22. And there in Psalms 22 is a vivid picture of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. He had to die. Russ, I'm sorry. I believe he's worth our worship and our work. Are you willing to work for Jesus? Are you willing to worship him? Well, man, I don't know when we're going to be able to get back together, be able to look around the room and see people, not have to look at the pew and imagine who always sits there and try to vision in my eye, the mind. The, the, I know who sits there. I talk like I'm talking to you. Well, you ain't here. One day we'll get back together. Lord, I hope this room is full. I hope we realize that it is a time to come together and praise and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a time to leave whatever it is you're doing out there in the world and make up your mind you're going to give Jesus this day. Oh, I hope we do. And I hope it's soon. I hope it's soon. But I challenge you to know this. Till we get together again, you're not alone. All these TV celebrities and everybody, everybody, you're not in this alone. We're in this together. Well, amen, amen, amen. But you know what? All of them folk up there in Washington, D.C. or New York City or Atlanta, Georgia or, or wherever, Savannah, Georgia, that say, well, we're in this together. We're in this together. You know what? I hate to tell you this. That don't mean a whole lot to me. But when I read that I will never go anywhere, that Jesus is not already there. And his promise is, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That is good. That is good. And because he's made that promise to us, and because we read in his precious word about how much he loves us, I challenge you this week, I, I don't know anything. I'm not smart enough. I try to listen to folks who know more than me about medicines and, and sicknesses and health issues. I, I confess I, I'm not smart enough. So I try to do what I'm told. I recommend you do what we're told. Uh, I know that I've, I've talked to some folks who, who didn't want to, and they thought maybe, you know, this is all a hoax, and it's not real. And, and you check out how many people are dying from this virus versus how many die from the flu or how many die from cancer or, or all these other things. And there's a lot of ifs and what ifs. But this much I know. Till Jesus comes again, you and I are to serve him. Oh, and did you know he told us to obey the law? He really did. Ow. Sometimes I, I wish he hadn't have said that, but he did. And you better. You better. Or we'll be sorry. Look, I love you. And if you believe in Jesus and you know you're not right with him, but you want to get right with him, but you don't know how, call me. Uh, cell phone, home phone. Uh, it's listed and you you get a hold of me we will be we'd love to talk to you about jesus i guess i'd rather talk to you about jesus than anything in the world what about it your call is all that matters god bless you and i pray you have a great week i pray you you do what you ought to do to take care of your family and loved ones and we appreciate it let's bow and pray together lord because of what you did do for us on calvary's cross because you did shed your blood there, and they, they beat you unmercifully. They nailed you to that cross. And, Lord, you gave up your life and shed your blood so that my sins could be washed away. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And I hope and pray, God, that all of us who are uh, listening to the sound of your word being shared, I pray, God, we all realize that because of Calvary's cross, we can know, have an assurance, a positiveness, we're going to heaven because of you. Bless us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. We love you.